Hi everybody, welcome to our SimScale's latest webinar. Uh, my name is John Wilde and today I'm joined also by Hamouda Youssef from the Qatar Green Building Council. And we wanted to talk to you today about thermal comfort within buildings and how that connects to energy efficiency. Hello everyone, uh, thank you John for the um, introduction and thanks for uh, working us again once again to do the um, another webinar. I'm glad to be with you and hopefully it will be of an added value to our attendees. Yeah, I hope so too. I also just noticed how amazing your photo is in comparison to my fuzzy one. Um, I, I don't know if you wanted to give a, a wider kind of introduction um, about who you are exactly, Hamuda. You're more than welcome to. So um, I'm um, a sustainability advocate and, and consultant for the past 10 plus years. Uh, with architecture background, so I'm an architect um, in principle, but has been getting into sustainability as a wider context uh, since then. Um, recent, over the past six years, I've been working in the Qatar Green Building Council on the different roles, but primarily to promote the education and raise uh, awareness of sustainability and how it can be um, integrated in different aspects, not just buildings, but corporate sustainability and uh, outreach and community engagement is something that now is highly intervened of, of, with what we do. Uh, so I'm a well and lead faculty as well by, um, by practice uh, and it's something that added lots to my, um, I think to my background discussions when we speak with everyone later. Perfect, thank you. And I am a VP of customer success here with SimScale, so running the pre and post sales engineering teams as well as the product management team and I'm also right now product manager for Thermal Comfort, so I'm very interested in Thermal Comfort and how SimScale can help our customers and future customers to design better buildings and especially more efficient and green buildings. A, a quick bit of background on who SimScale, who, what SimScale is and who we are fundamentally. So um, we're now nearly eight years old. We're getting pretty global so we have our headquarters here in Munich in Germany where I'm based and we have a couple of offices also in the US. This actually says 80 plus employees, I think we're getting close to 90 and pretty soon I think going to cross 100. L hundreds of thousands of users worldwide um, and honestly it's really amazing for me to see how many people are online at any one time and utilizing SimScale is pretty um, fantastic and exciting to see. We've created the world's first cloud-based and also web-based um, engineering simulation platform. Today we're really going to only be focusing on the CFD aspects, so looking at fluid dynamics, but we can also cover FEA with solid mechanics and thermodynamics. And like I said, everything is in a web browser. We will also show SimScale live today to give you an idea of what it looks like. Did you want to speak to this slide, Hamuda? Yeah. Uh, so as a Green Building Council, we are um, 10 years old uh, in the market, uh, promoting sustainability in different aspects. Uh, we look at buildings from the built environment, so the wider context of buildings of sorts. Uh, and through the years, we have developed uh, several um, programs and um, that tackle sustainability from different uh, points of view. And that speak to the right audience of sorts. Uh, so the pillars are between the research, outreach, and education. And in, in between all of these, you see our outreach programs, like the Green Building Conference or Sustainability Awards, or Sustainability Week and then technical programs like um, promoting things like well uh, building standards, eco schools, um, better place for people with the World Green Building Council and eco campus and green keeper hospitality. Uh, so that's in a very nutshell um, what we do but of course you can find more information on our website. Cool, thank you. It's also a topic really close to my heart. If I think if I wasn't working here I would be doing something that was solely to do with um, green energy and sustainability. Very interesting. Okay, so today um, we're going to focus on thermal comfort and energy efficiency, um, actually in a smaller um, office building than the large scale mall that you see here. Um, Hamoud is going to kick off with a, a kind of general introduction on thermal comfort and energy efficiency in lead buildings. And then I'll take over talking about how we assess thermal comfort and what some of the um, abbreviations mean. Then we'll dig into more specifically how SimScale can help you evaluate thermal comfort and then with a test case. We'll run through a few iterations trying to kind of optimize our design as we progress to make sure that we in the end end up with a comfortable atmosphere for everybody. And then we'll kind of wrap up and we have some time for questions and answers at the end. There is also a questions um, 
window so at any point if you have questions and you would like to ask them just type away if they're relevant right then we'll speak to them or we might kind of hold a few towards the end of the presentation okay so at this point i'll hand over to hamuda who's going to share his own screen and walk through a presentation as well yes perfect yep. okay fantastic uh so let's get started uh so to give more time for the questions and to look at the simulations later on so what i will do over the next few minutes is to just to set the stage uh, for some of the principles and uh, foundation information about the thermal comfort and uh, energy efficiency. Uh, our reference mainly will be for two rating systems when it comes to green buildings. Uh, the wheel building standard and lead uh, building uh, 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 certification system. Um, so something to note is that we spend more than 90% of our time indoor. Uh, and in a region like ours, in the Middle East, this number goes higher up to 95 percent. Uh, so that's why putting time and effort into understanding how to achieve our thermal comfort to enhance our air quality is something crucial uh, because this is our environment. We don't spend much of time anymore outdoors as we used to do. Uh, so that gives the importance of what we're doing and, and why we should focus that. If you look into several uh, rating systems and LEED as an example, you will find when things capture the indoor environmental quality, there are several things that tackle uh, thermal comfort and indoor air quality. Uh, although the focus today will be on thermal comfort, but we will touch base on air quality because it, this is the, I would say, the first step uh, into ensuring that we have the right air quality in the space and then building on that to reach the thermal comfort intended. <clears throat> so starting with thermal comfort, uh, we need to understand what's thermal comfort in the first place. So when we look at thermal comfort, we have uh, a defining standard, which is ASHRAE 55. And from that, you can find that to define a thermal comfort for a space, you need to underline three, six parameters, uh, from radial temperature to metabolic rate, air speed, air temperature, uh, clothing, and humidity. Uh, of course, we can define these between environmental factors and personal factors, but all in all, these are the six parameters that we need to tackle if we want to achieve thermal comfort. And as I mentioned, the standard is the ASHRAE 55. If you are in Europe, you have another standard, but more or less all of, all of the standards speak the same language. Why thermal comfort is important? Uh, because in, if it's in warmer temperatures, uh, it can impact your productivity in cooler or warmer temperature. If the space is too cold or too warm, this impacts your uh, productivity in this part several research and studies and the links are in, in the um, handouts so um, if you go into the um, how we can comply as I mentioned you need to comply with ASHRAE standard 55 or equivalent equal like the SEND in Europe or ISO standards or whatever it differs from one version or another to th 2010 or 14 and 18 it depends on where you are and which country you follow but more or less this is our go-to place uh, the principle is to select and design conditioning strategy. How, what kind of function are we having in the space? And based on that, what kind of activities uh, that are being entailed and what kind of air condition or thermal comfort that I need to achieve. Uh, and the way of doing that from a surface or uh, radiant heating or humidity, which is, is crucial, and air speed has um, a very important aspect because it, it impacts what we call the real feel or what you feel temperature. Um, that said, if you are in a mechanically conditioned or a naturally conditioned uh, space, there is minor um, difference in there, but same six parameters are applied. Examples of thermal control, uh, some of the things that we see, in, especially in open office spaces, and today the simulation will be within an op uh, open office space, that how to give people control. Um, it's not enough just from a design perspective to say, yes, we are meeting the standards, but you need to keep in mind the um, variance of people's uh, conception of their thermal comfort, which can vary from one person to another. So it's important to give them some control uh, on an individual space or a micro space or a macro space. From thermostats, ceiling fans, uh, adjustable underflow diff diffusers, uh, or task-mounted controls of operable windows. So it's important within the design that it's not just the what you as a designer think, but it's important, equally important to align that with the end user's expectations. So aligning with the uh, thermal comfort is the air quality uh, issues. 
uh, why air quality it's um, sorry, I've got this um, hair quality uh, um, air quality issues because as I mentioned the spending more most of the time indoor if we don't have enough ventilation in the space this will undermine our thermal comfort uh, so even if uh, if we don't have the as I mentioned enough the air quality in space this will undermine our thermal comfort uh, and unfortunately it's um, the indoor pollution is typically higher than outdoor pollution which uh, people typically don't uh, know that um, our standards as well in doing that we have it depends on if, if you have a mechanical natural or mixed mode the American standard is the ASHRAE 62.1 and you have equivalent European standards um, in, in different places that's for the mechanical ventilated spaces and for the natural ventilated spaces we have the ASHRAE again ASHRAE 62 but and we have the SIPSI um, standard as well these the found founding information in air quality is that we need to maintain a minimum of 10 CFM uh, per uh, per occupant so that's um, a change, exchange of air per minute uh, that's the number per occupant we need to maintain the minimum uh, and then it depends on the function you can increase more of course you can add more strategies to increase ventilation the more fresh air you have the more productive you are the more thermal comfort actually you can feel uh, so in between I would say this quick um, founding concepts that's where we need to, co to uh, understand where, why do we need the simulation to do because we have different parameters between the six parameters of thermal comfort the minimum requirements of indoor air quality coupling this if we look at synergies uh, with the energy mandates um, so speaking of energy lots of people think that a green building is just energy and water efficient uh, but what we always say that it's energy and water efficient after complying with the standard of providing a proper thermal comfort so first you need to establish a good air quality first you need to establish good thermal comfort and then find ways of doing these while reducing your energy demand or being more efficient so don't start by saying I need to be energy efficient because you can do that if you lose your occupant satisfaction or their comfort in, 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 the, in the middle so today we'll just focus in the and how to reduce energy demand um, and as of, again some principles uh, looking at lead uh, as, as a reference we have several categories and triggers that tackle the, um, the topic between establishing minimum energy performance and optimizing the energy performance later and a number of other uh, critters that are not of our focus for today so quickly um, to reduce our energy demand we have a couple of strategies uh, from establishing your design and energy goals as I mentioned to ensure thermal comfort optimize building orientation form and size uh, maximizing shading potential using nature nature from daylight and ventilation uh, properly insulating uh, was using a, a efficient building envelope and that's again a good use for your simulation to try and test several materials and see what's more optimized for use and later on during operation monitor consumption I'll quickly go through a couple of sketches uh, but you can see the handouts later on um, but orientation and building understanding the basic principle of some path movement summer winter wind uh, how to in, um, maximize in the prevailing wind if it's cool in summer and if it's warm in winter um, positioning of the uh, air movement in the space and utilizing different shading potentials in there so letting in the daylight without the thermal load if it's the summertime and vice versa if it's winter time um, so in between this what what we call the passive techniques um, you can see the underlying principle of enhancing our thermal comfort in the space uh, and moving with the principle uh, basic principles of positive pressure negative pressure cold air go down hot air goes up so these kind of air movement principles that again uh, impact our uh, thermal comfort in space um, I will not take much of time but there are lots of strategies to enhance uh, and ensure our energy efficiency with, without undermining um, thermal comfort uh, but that's mostly it from my end and I will get uh, now it's your end uh, George I'll take it further thank you cool thank you very much
Um, I'll now work doubly fast. <laughs> um, we, yeah, thanks for, thanks for uh, running through that. I'll also, um, I'm going to try and kind of reflect on what you talked about as well as we go. I think there's an interesting um, aspect of our design decision that we did incorrectly, and I'll explain why in a second. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about kind of echoing what you're doing or mirroring what is thermal comfort, but digging a little bit more into, I think, what each of these six variables mean. Um, I mean, a long time ago, when I first got introduced to this, uh, everyone talked about predicted mean vote and percentage of people dissatisfied, and I had no clue what it meant. I mean, this was really years ago now, but I think still it um, is nice to show this graph, and it helps to explain what they both mean. So if you look at the two scales on the graph, um, you can see along the bottom that you've got the predicted mean vote, and we want to aim as close as to zero as we can, but between plus and minus, um, or minus 0.5 and plus 0.5, that's like the happily sitting within the ASHRAE standard. Um, if we get outside of that, we get too cold or too hot, and then the percentage of people dissatisfied will increase. So we want to really kind of aim for that middle section. Within CFD, we're actually computing a few different values. So on the left-hand side, we calculate the air temperature, and that will obviously be based on the supply coming in, and then whatever happens um, with the heat sources in the room, be that people, computers, um, even solar radiation through the window. We'll take into account mean radiant temperature and the airspeed. And then the, the values on the right-hand side that we input into the CFD calculation are the clothing coefficient, metabolic rate, and air humidity. And I think it's worth also mentioning with humidity, obviously that could change throughout the study. Um, in SimScale, we assume a specific fixed value, which you can choose. Um, but it, I think it, it's important to mention right, that, it, it, that it could change, so it shouldn't necessarily always be something that you um, input as a single point. Okay, so digging into each of those a little bit more. Um, the clothing coefficient, um, basically, we actually have missed off the left-hand side of the scale, so someone that's totally naked has a clothing coefficient of zero, and that's really the starting point. Um, and then as we kind of go along, most people working in offices are probably going to be sitting around the 1 to 1.3 or 4 or so. Um, and then obviously in the colder environments, we continue on upwards throughout the scale. Um, metabolic rate is the amount of energy that we're burning, so the chemical reactions in our body happening and we're giving off heat. And someone who is sitting, um, they have a, a value of one, and obviously that kind of increases as we go. And again, we, we aim for somewhere between like one and 1.1 1 .1 or so for someone who's working in an office. Um, and obviously if we were looking at different types of rooms like gym halls and stuff, that um, value would increase as we go upwards through the scale of movement. We also take into account airspeed, and that can be, that's essentially the, the magnitude of the flow or the, uh, the velocity of the flow anywhere around our occupants, that's where we're really interested. You'll see in our study later that we have airspeed um, quite fast coming out of the diffuser, but along the ceiling. So it's okay that it's fast, it's really when we're looking at the airspeed, and this is what feeds into thermal comfort, the airspeed very close to our people that we really care about. And we want that to stay beneath around 0.8 meters a second. And then the other two values that come into it as well are humidity. So obviously totally dry air has a humidity of zero and totally wet air where you would have mist or fog um, has a humidity of 100. And normally um, we enter this value in SIM scale because it normally doesn't change too much within a study. So we can pick that value that we're interested in. And the more complicated thing to calculate is the mean radiant temperature. So this is looking at um, a point in the model and looking at how all of the walls um, affect that, that point. So, I mean, me sitting here right now in this room, um, if any of the walls are colder than me, I'm, I'm losing heat to those walls through radiation and vice versa. So if there's a radiator sitting there, which there is, it's not that warm, but it's warm, warmer than me, I'm going to be gaining heat from, from that radiator. And all of those kind of surfaces come together to give you the mean radiant temperature at any point within the model. So there's a lot um, that goes on behind the scenes. This is actually what, um, this is showing mean radiant temperature, right? And so looking at the people um, and what they're radiating out. 
Within SimScale, we basically assume like a size weighted average. So we're not calculating at different individual points, but we're summing everything together, which for rooms like this is perfectly acceptable. Um, it's only when you have very strange organic shapes that that, tend, that maybe isn't the most desirable approach, but for, for most applications, it's pretty, pretty okay. Okay, so I'm going to dig um, into our specific use case, and that's an office sitting in Qatar. It basically has four people sitting at a desk. They're all using computers. They have workstations underneath the tables, which are also giving off heat. And we want to look at a few different things. We want to look at um, what the ideal air temperature is as it comes in through the supply in the ceiling, and then it gets extracted through a couple of outlets in the corners and whether wall insulation could have a positive or negative impact on our occupants. We want to ensure that our predicted mean vote, which obviously takes into account the percentage of people dissatisfied, um, sits between minus 0.5 and 0.5, and we want to try and use as little energy as possible. Okay, so to walk you through the scenario, and I will do this as well in SimScale itself so you can get an idea of what that looks like, um, but I'll, I'll walk you through it here first. So basically we have four people sitting there, everyone giving off about 80 watts. Um, so they're not thinking too hard, but they're sitting there and working. We have four workstations under the desks. Um, and we have on our external walls um, a, a U-value. So over on the right-hand side, basically, we can account for the U-value of those walls, even though they're not modeled here. And we'll still, we'll still lose or gain heat at a slightly lower rate due to the insulation that we have. And the, the box down here shows what it looks like in SimScale, so we just simply enter that exact value. Similarly for the window, um, we still have um, this U value, but also we're adding solar radiation. Um, so this is like roughly a little bit less than half of what the sun is fully capable of on a hot day at noon, um, which is about right because we've got a vertical surface. Um, and we're trying to still take the worst possible case. We've also, um, with our walls and our ceilings, made a couple of design decisions. So our walls internally are considered to be adiabatic. So this is probably worst case. So no heat can be lost from the room. It will stay as warm as it possibly can. And our ceilings do have a little bit of um, energy lost from the top and the bottom. We have one air supply coming in, in with the blue arrow and it passes through the diffuser. Um, most diffusers are designed for the flow to pass across the ceiling and I'll show you how that works. And then obviously it, it passes around the room and mixes and then exits out of the two extracts and then out through the main ductwork. We chose a circular diffuser. Um, I, I think actually our results would have been very similar with any. Um, I think more, and correct me if I'm wrong as well, Hamuda, I think this this is more important when you get to much larger and larger rooms and the diffusers all start interacting with each other and then the situation becomes a lot more complicated. Pretty much all of them, nearly, um, have quite a stark or sharp angle of the flow on the outlet, basically to enable the coanda effect. So basically that's a, a low pressure region, and uh, you'll see the blue arrow here, um, which occurs right next to the ceiling. And that essentially pulls the flow to, to the surface of the ceiling and it kind of adheres or sticks to the ceiling almost all the way to the outside of the room. Um, and that's like the throw value that, we're, that we get from data sheets of our diffusers, so that the throw is how far it will go before the coanda starts losing its uh, power and it will then fall, um, the flow will kind of fall and drop into the room. So there's three main steps to run through in SimScale. Um, we would model our CAD in maybe um, Revit, Rhino, SketchUp, whatever package you happen to have. Um, and you import the model directly into SimScale. Then we'll run through the setup, which is pretty much what I just talked through, and I'll show you that anyway on the platform. And then we can analyze our results. And that's really the powerful part where we can actually start to um, answer our questions, like our, are our occupants comfortable or not? And if not, why? That's really the difficult thing to know um, without running simulation. Okay, so I'll take a quick look through some of the results too. So this was, with the setup that I explained, so we have the, the flow rate of the inlet um, of around 19 centigrade, and we have the sunlight coming in through the window at the side, and we have the occupants and the computers giving off heat. And we are not within where we would like to be, so our occupants should be in this kind of happy green region between 
minus 0.5 and 0.5, they're actually way away from there, often four times as high, so in the value of nearer to two, which is definitely going to be very, very uncomfortable for our occupants. And so, so far, we, we know that our baseline design is not okay. The other thing that we should look at as well, um, so, so we, we know um, that our, our temperatures are probably too high, but what we need to look at is also the flow rate. So the flow rate here um, is quite low, so 0.1 to 0.2 meters a second or so, which is pretty much only natural convection at that point. It's so low that the forced convection wouldn't have that much effect. But the nice thing is we can go up to 0.8 and still be within the standard, uh, the ASHRAE standard and still have comfortable occupants. So we could, if we wanted to, start to increase the, the inlet or the supply flow rate. And looking at temperatures too, our average temperature is 27 degrees centigrade. This is definitely also not going to feel very comfortable. And you'll see as well, um, and this obviously makes sense, that on the left-hand side here, nearer the window, um, where the radiation is coming in directly, our occupants are going to be slightly warmer than if they're further away from any of the heat sources. What we thought maybe is interesting to look at, and this was the thing I think we shouldn't have done in this order. So, Hamuda, I really apologize because we're working a little upside down. Um, but what we should do, and you're very correct, we should look to optimize for thermal comfort first and then look for energy gains after. Um, actually, we're doing it a little um, backwards, but I think for this example, it's not too bad. So we basically, we can look at how much energy is basically inputted um, through the room. So looking at the in, an outlet um, and having a, a quick comparison to see how much heat we gain. And obviously, we can validate how much of that is entering through the window. So the, the occupants and the desktops or the, the workstations, all of that energy is pretty fixed. We can't do anything. And what we can change is the energy that comes in through the walls and the window. So what we thought we would try is to, to choose different walls and choose different windows. So we've moved from um, no insulation to a thick layer of insulation between bricks on the walls and on the window, moving from double to triple glazing. Obviously, this adds a lot to the cost, so we want to make sure that it's, it's worth it, really. In this instance, before we've optimized for thermal comfort, we can definitely say that it isn't really worth it. Um, so the average temperature drops by around half a degree centigrade, not very significant. And you can see that the occupants, their um, predicted mean vote does change a little bit, so they're all a little bit more comfortable, um, but still not going to be particularly happy working in this room. Um, like I said, though, the flow rate is quite low, so it's 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. So really what we should have done, I think, at the very beginning is to ramp up the flow rate and to see if we can, um, without putting extra power into the chiller unit outside and kind of trying to bring down our 42 degrees um, ambient air to something sensible, um, we could have just um, spun up the fan a little bit more and pushed some more air in to see if um, a higher airspeed and obviously more changes per hour would have had an impact. One thing I thought is interesting, though, is even though this isn't that useful, um, it's still an energy saving, and that's pretty important. So, so we do still save energy, um, assuming that we want to get to the same point. So it does kind of at least highlight that, and I guess this needs to then be some kind of trade-off. Is it worth the additional cost in insulation and double to triple glazing versus what we would save in running the, the chillers throughout the year? Okay, so what we then did is what I think we should have done in the first place is look at, um, well, two things actually. One is cool down the inlet a little bit, so going from 19 to 18 degrees. Um, that's a pretty linear scale, expectedly so, so we've got everyone is a little bit more comfortable um, and the average temperature has dropped a little bit, but actually our occupants are still quite uncomfortable. So from this point on, we kind of have two options, right? So the second one, which is what we won't do, um, is lower the supply temperature even further. Um, while we have quite low flow in the room, actually there's very little value in doing this. We're not going to gain really anything because um, we want more, more flow coming through the room to kind of pull more of that heat, and more of that energy out of the room and um, out into the atmosphere or wherever it might actually go. So we're not going to take the second option, but what we will do is take the first option. So we can increase the air supply. Um, maybe even to like two or four times what it is right now, and we would still be well within the ASHRAE standard. 
Muda, by the way, if there's anything you want to add as I'm going, feel free to jump in. You're you're more than welcome. No, it's pretty good. I don't want to interrupt these and the the flow of thoughts so far. <laughs> okay, no problem. I don't mind, but fantastic. Okay, so um, what what we did from this point is to to leverage what I think SimScale can do best is running everything in parallel in the cloud. So basically, we ran, and you'll see here, a bunch of different velocity inlets with all different flow rates. So we kept the temperature the same, ran multiple different flow rates, and then we could start to look at a comparison between the results. And what I want to do is very quickly show you how I did that. So basically, I'm going to just jump to SimScale for maybe five minutes at the most, just to kind of explain what we can see here and how we, how we get to these results and how we can do these comparisons in the cloud. So starting off with the results, this is our room, and we can spin it around and kind of interrogate and see what is happening. If we want to, we can pick specific values. So I can pick this person and say, okay, tell me the PMV right here on this person. This looks pretty bad. And it's at 1.86. Um, all of the, the surfaces that you can see that are shaded are shaded by PMV, and the scale on the left here goes from minus 3 up to 3. So actually for this 18 degree scenario, everybody's pretty comfortable. What I can also do is add a cutting plane through the middle. And this cutting plane is showing velocity. And again, the scale is on the left-hand side. So blue is low and red is high. And we're basically looking at um, yeah, from zero up to one meters a second. So not particularly high. And I'm showing vectors as well. So we can get an idea of where the flow is going. So you can see it essentially comes along the ceiling as per the Coanda effect, which is exactly what we would expect. And it falls down. Um, and then starts to recirculate, so you you have a slightly higher velocity next to people's feet, which can be fairly common, um, and then it starts to pass around the room, and it's, it's nice, I think, to be able to see exactly where the flow is going. So if one person was uncomfortable, for example, and the others were comfortable, maybe it's more to do with the flow rate or the velocity and where the flow is going than anything else, and this is a nice way to understand that. The other thing that I think is really useful is an ISO surface. And basically, you can set this to any value you want and you can show any variable that you would like to. I'm just going to turn off the floor. I think it'll help. So basically, on this ISO surface, I'm looking at velocity. So I'm looking at all velocities at 0.3 meters a second. And it's also shaded by pressure. And we could maybe change that to temperature or whatever else we wanted to. And I like this because it's... Um, if we have an imbalance in the flow and we don't really know where the flow is going inside, we can very quickly see like spots of high or low velocity air within the room and get an idea of, okay, maybe there's a jet here, you know, and we didn't know that there was a jet falling from this diffuser onto this person. So this is, we either need to change the design or maybe move the furniture, right, so nobody sits in this spot. So we could optimize in a slightly different way. Uh, the last thing I'll do is just quickly walk through how we got to this point. So showing the tree on the left, <clears throat> we first start off with importing our geometry up here. And you can basically import just by dragging and dropping your file. And then we run top to bottom to set the model up. So we have our air material. We have a bunch of different boundary conditions. And I'll say pick maybe the window to have a quick look at how we did it. Um, so this is the window over here. And you'll see it highlighted on the screen. And we can basically now enter our data. Um, so we've got here our U value, here is the radiation from the sun, um, and that's that's pretty much it. So that's our window, and we have over here our velocity in there, and again you can see it highlighted here. And if we wanted to, we could change this velocity in there, and I think this is really what I wanted to, to talk about. Um, so I'll, I'll explain just the rest of the setup, and then I'll return to this. So really, we, we set up our humans, our windows, our computers, all of the things that are either... Um, contributing to the flow rate or adding or removing heat from our model, all of the things that we know. And then um, we simply come down here and press the plus sign and that will start a simulation. And then SimScale will tell us all of the things that we don't know, all of the things that we want to know. So what I could do here is say, okay, like tell me if I have a one meter a second or cubic meter a second um, flow rate of my inlet, now go ahead and run on the cloud. So I'll call it one uh, meter cubed a second and press start and that will now go off to the cloud and run and it will appear down here on the left hand side and once it's complete I can start to dig into the results and compare between my different designs 
And that is what I want to do in the, the remainder of the presentation. If I can add a couple of things up here. Yeah, please. Um, yes. So something to consider when setting up your options. As we clearly seen, uh, like if we're just centering or focusing on energy efficiency and just need to add more insulation or how go for triple glazing while ignoring your thermal requirements, you will be losing anyway. So despite the sum saving, you will you wouldn't be it wouldn't be acceptable. Um, additionally, um, be careful when increasing the velocity, the air velocity of the acoustics, uh, because still, even if we look at now for thermal comfort, but acoustic comfort is something important for the users. Um, so ramping up the velocity is not the only solution, as long as you couple it with proper consideration for the acoustics. Uh, requirements. Uh, so something to keep in mind as we look into our parameters and where should we optimize the space uh, for the end user comfort overall. Yeah, that's a good point. Really interesting too. Um, yeah, definitely a fair point. Do you have any experience with, um, <clears throat> by the way, I think we had around three meters a second through the ductwork on the inlet and that was obviously the highest because it's the, the smallest um, cross-sectional area. Do you have any experience with what the maximum um, velocities should be before we start to um, get affected by uh, or negatively affected by acoustics. It varies. It varies from the cross section of the duct work uh, because bigger ones can have higher speed and smaller ones can make more noise. Uh, so it varies. I, I don't want to give numbers because it varies from case by case uh, because it's in relation with the um, cross section of the. Um, the ductwork and the duct insulation as well. Uh, ductwork insulation, even if you speed it up, but you have the proper insulation, I mean the acoustic insulation, it will it will bring down the acoustics. So it's it needs to be added uh, in line, um, but there is no right number. I don't want to, to put the right number there because there is no right number. It, it's case by case. Yeah, totally fine. Um, I thought it was just interesting to ask, um, and I, I agree, it must be case by case. I mean, you could do anything to insulate um, from sound as well. Just interesting. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so to kind of um, wrap up our journey of optimizing this room for thermal comfort, um, what we did, and we actually didn't look at acoustics, but yeah, good point. We ran um, a couple of different flow rates. Actually, we ran a whole bunch, but I, I'm just showing a couple at the end. And that's the really cool thing about, I think, for me at least, using SimScale and pushing everything in parallel to the cloud, that we can run a whole different array of flow rates and get an understanding of our, our exact perfect one, you know, rather than just kind of running one or two. So we can run a bunch and then compare them all and decide which one is our optimum. So these um, with like two and a half to three times the flow speed, um, still not too crazy, but a little bit kind of higher flow speed within the room. Getting into the region where you can see I've highlighted over here on the right, of maybe 0.3, potentially 0.4 meters a second, just in front of the face of that person there. Um, still from a comfort perspective, totally acceptable. So that's a really good starting point. And then we can actually also take a look at thermal comfort and see if you know now everybody is happy. And actually, we're amazingly very close to zero for nearly everybody. So the spectrum kind of goes, I guess, a little bit from zero up to less than 0.5. So now we've, with both of these designs, so there's the, the, the lower speed on the, the left and the even higher speed on the right. And um, it gives you an idea of how, how we kind of, that we're now in the right kind of range. So the nice thing is that what we know what we can tell is that we don't need to have three times the flow speed, actually two and a half times, still leaves all of our occupants, this is the most uncomfortable occupant here on the, the far left, but still leaves everybody in a thermally comfortable situation. So we don't need to waste energy on um, ramping up the, the flow speed any higher. Um, there, there is a question I think that's probably worth asking. Um, if we run a parametric study, can we like compare everything side by side right now in SimScale? Um, actually, that's something we're looking at pretty aggressively right now because I appreciate that that is hugely, hugely valuable. So at the moment, no, you can't compare um, side by side designs, but we definitely want to be there very soon because what I imagine, at least in my mind, is, okay, I'll go back one slide, looking at these exact two plots side by side on SimScale. Um, and if you add a coupling in one, you see it in the other one, so you can get a very quick comparison. 
Um, right now, what I tend to do, and I'll swap back really quickly into SimScale, is um, add result controls. So what I'll do is pick, say, pro points at different points in the model. Um, and you'll see a few different ones listed here, and you'll see on the inside. Um, and these you can compare. So very quickly, I can say, okay, show me the, the temperature or a comfort at different points in the model. So that's kind of how we're doing it right now. Um, yeah, and it works. It works pretty well as it is. Uh, okay, I'm going to wrap up and then I think I'll, I'll talk to some of the other questions. So just some of the, the kind of key learnings and a, a quick summary. So we've basically run through what we would do um, to assess the thermal comfort of a space. So we've got an idea of how much energy we could save. We've got an idea of what cooling strategies definitely don't work and which definitely do. Um, and we've learned, I guess, that CFDs are a, a really valuable tool to assess thermal comfort. So we haven't actually had to do any physical real-world testing. Um, just from a CAD model, we can do some very quick design studies to get an understanding of um, how successful this design will be. We can understand the energy consumption, and we can really importantly optimize our design. So we could even change the geometry if we wanted to. So if we figured out that maybe we need two diffusers, um, or different type of diffuser if perhaps we've got like some interaction between the flow and somehow it's making a jet in the room you know we can start to move things around to optimize for the the, the best flow rate and we can look at different types of insulation um, changing the the actual boundary conditions like the flow speeds of the supply and return rates um, and the temperatures too so there's a lot of different things that we can try um, to to get towards our optimum design okay um, Thank you very much for listening, and thank you as well for speaking and contributing, Hamuda. That was really, really interesting. I think at this point, we can take some questions. Maybe you have some for me, Hamuda, or the other way around. And there's also a bunch to talk through that we've been asked from the, the audience. Yeah, it's, it's been really interesting. And as I mentioned, to reiterate on the um, best practices, once, once we reach the stage where, similar to what you've shown, that this is the optimal thermal comfort, uh, now will be the step where to see how to optimize energy efficiency, um, passively at least. So if no more efficiency can be tackled from the HVAC system that it's already optimized from delivering the uh, cooling demand, the speed and everything, this will be now the step to start to see what's the maximum or the optimum uh, insulation that I can add for the walls or for the glazing, for instance. Uh, because we don't want people to, some people think that if you go for tepid glazing, it will be better. Best, it's not always better. Yes, it's better on the long run, but it might add lots of added costs or capital costs that you don't need in the first place. So once you optimize the space from an end user perspective, try to take the similar steps of testing how to step-by-step -step enhance your, your insulation, enhance your energy efficiency overall, uh, looking into your light fixtures, you're looking into your equipments, how to decrease the demand, the thermal demand in the first place, uh, passively from the building envelope. Uh, building The ceiling height will, will has a good factor, can have a good factor there. Um, and then looking into your HVAC side of how can we make the uh, equipment more efficient, how can we have uh, variable air speeds or, or VRVs that can uh, reflect based on the demand and the capacity of the room. If we, in some cases maybe we don't have the room always with four people in, in space so we don't want to spend more energy in providing cooling for four people while we only have one or two so responding to these kind of scenarios uh, will provide uh, um, better efficiency over the long run and during the operation so it's something to consider it's something that you will master um, as you see more cases and see more examples and then you'll find you establish your own I would say best practices uh, but as, as long as you understand the parameters that's I think where would be the good start get ha good hands on the parameters and then build your best optimized case uh, one by one that's really interesting because you ultimately I guess need an intelligent room which will kind of customize based on the activities that are happening in the room, right? That's at least yes, what it makes me feel. Because, yeah, because you can connect it. You have several ways of connecting, like 
you can connect your thermostats with CO2 sensors, for instance. So CO2 sensors are good indication uh, for occupancy. Uh, number of people in the room, so it goes up and down, and you can have smarter ways, but we shouldn't jump and think of these before establishing the foundation. The cheapest, I would say, the um, low-cost options, uh, like the uh, thermal insulation, provide insulation, uh, uh, um, optimizing the thermal comfort overall, then we can look into more, I would say, more sophisticated solutions that will increase the efficiency, uh, but we can't go there without having the first step in the right place. Yeah, perfect, thanks. Um, okay, there's a there's a bunch of questions. I guess you can see them too. I'll, I'll run through a few. They look quite sim scale specific. Um, but let me let me speak to a couple if that's okay. Um, so one is, can we um, project or predict the locations of potential condensation once the model is uh, once we have the results on screen? And we can. We would. Um, I would use an ISO surface like before, so that kind of 3D surface that you saw, um, and really focused on the dew point of of the air. Right. So if we pick that the dew point temperature, um, that will give us a, a a nice indication at least of where we would like we are likely to see condensation. Um, if we want to update or change the diffuser design, at the moment, um, the, the best way to do that is through the, your CAD package. So you would change the diffuser in CAD and then upload it again to SimScale. But you could um, essentially copy the project. So similarly to what we did before uh, when we had things running in parallel, you create a, another copy of the design um, and you update the CAD. So then you have all of the same boundary conditions and materials that, um, that, are, in, that are in the project. So you can make sure that you're kind of mirroring or comparing um, apples to apples, so your design or your results will be comparable. I think two more questions that are interesting to talk about. One is um, how long did this take, um, and what new features are coming over the next few months? So I'll speak to the the second one first. So how what new features are coming over the next months? Um, that's the the most fun thing I think about being here and also being product manager here is that, and the fact that we also have um, a, a significant funding, so we're really kind of looking to the future with um, with our imagination to to decide, you know, where we can really go and what is most interesting and exciting. So I'm focusing personally right now on thermal comfort, and I'd definitely be very happy to hear from anyone about where what we could develop for thermal comfort. I have a, a list of dozens of features, and I definitely already have a top ten. Um, but it would be very interesting to get more data points. So there's, there's always more information out there. So if you want to reach out, um, you're more than welcome to, to share your thoughts on where we could build and how SimScale could develop to best serve you. And the other question was, um, how long did it take to run these analyses? So I think more importantly is looking at the bigger picture as well. So how long did it take from CAD to, to getting to a bunch of results? So, I mean, the CAD upload obviously takes only a few seconds, and then the actual setup process that I walk through can take maybe five minutes, maybe 10, if you don't particularly know what you're doing. Um, and then mostly everything else is automated. So at that point, you would just hit the plus button like I did, and you set your run underway. And then you can go back and change things. So we could run different flow rates, different heat loads, um, and they all run in parallel, and they take roughly an hour or so, maybe at most, um, but the results update anyway in the background, so even before it's kind of totally finished, after maybe five minutes or six minutes or so, you can already start to look at some results, and you'll see something similar to what you see on the right-hand side there. So the results will already look pretty well developed. Um, they won't be like 100% accurate, but they'll be getting really in that direction, so it gives you a very quick and clear idea of whether you have a successful design or not. Um, and then once they're all done, obviously you can start to dig in and compare a little bit more. Um, we can work with pretty much any CAD file that you have, anything that, that is essentially of 3D geometry. So, so far, I don't think we've um, come up against anyone or any CAD packages we can't work with. Um, sometimes we might even, you know, read out like a, a generic file like a Parasolid, for example, but normally we work with native CAD files, which is normally preferable because you have higher quality um, geometry. Okay, um, is there anything else you wanted to add, Hamoud? Question, I have a question to you. Yeah, so sure. in, in the, the design is like one diffuser. Uh, is there any limitation if we have multiple diffusers with different designs or capacities in the room? So we can deal with each one independently or the software has some limitations in there? 
Yeah, good question. Um, as far as I've seen so far, the, the only limitation is the cloud, right? Um, and obviously, okay. everyone thinks there's a cloud as some infinite resource, but it, it isn't, right? I mean, they're really finite machines running on the other end. Um, but we run on very large machines and we could run on larger if we ever need to. So no, there isn't really a limit. I mean, we could run I mean, like the, the thing you saw here or the mall that we showed at the beginning. Um, those kind of large scale models, you would simply, um, or SimScale anyway, chooses the computer size that it would, that it thinks it needs automatically. Um, and it would simply scale up to larger and faster machines based on the, um, the, the size of the model that you throw at it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. It's actually really interesting too, I think, because of the the interaction between the different diffusers. Then you can end up with some crazy interesting um, flow patterns that have really unexpected um, effects on your occupant comfort. So it's pretty interesting. I mean, it, it, it goes both ways because um, something that we recommend is to start with a sample space, at least in the early stages, uh, so it will be quick and you get a quick indication of where you should go uh, and we highly rec I mean we typically recommend that you leave the big scale simulation till a bit more developed design has been taken care of uh, because you don't want people to spend lots of time in modeling uh, while missing the concept of what should we pick in the first place um, so that we, we don't want people to think that this is a modeling heavy exercise that they need to do like if I have a thousand square meter or something that I need to model it all, start with the concepts more scale that you can replicate and scale up, validate your points, and then as long as you have a good cloud, I think you can scale it up as you see fit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that's actually a good a good point as far as um, learning, honestly, any kind of simulation package goes. Um, not starting too crazy, like start with something like we had today get a good understanding. You obviously get quicker feedback because everything runs much faster. Yeah. Um, yeah, then once you understand the fundamentals, then scale up and look at your, your kind of real world large scale models. Yeah, good point. Okay, um, we're nearly um, already through an hour, which went very quickly. Um, I think at this point, um, Hamoud, I'll just say thank you. Um, it was really interesting to talk together, work together, and um, I look forward to doing so in the future. And also thank you to our audience as well for listening. Really great. Thank you very much. And uh, just to add, um, from an, um, we we will have a continuing education hours for for today's attendees. Everyone who attended at least forty minutes of the session uh, will receive uh, a lead uh, continuing education hour. So thank you for for joining us today. Cool. Thank you very much. Until next time. Bye. See you next time. Bye.